the new aid policy is designed to drive economic development in our region so that we can alleviate poverty and lift standards of living. It is quite a dramatic change in that we will be focusing first on our region and then on specific priority areas in order to drive economic development. We recognise that aid alone is not a panacea for poverty and so we're bringing a whole fresh new approach to it. Performance benchmarks are part of the new aid policy to ensure not only that we meet those benchmarks, but that recipient governments also take responsibility for the delivery of aid and the implementation of aid programs. You're watching The World From Below and that was a clip from Foreign Minister Julie Bishop explaining the political paradigm around aid spending. We're speaking with Tulsi Narayanasamy from Aidwatch. Aid, aid programs are not without controversy and Australia has had its fair share. In the wake of the war on terror, the Indonesian government established Detachment 88, an elite counter-terrorist unit that Australia helps to train. Serious allegations have been made in recent years that the force is being deployed in counter-separatist operations against the indigenous people of West Papua. AusAid has also been involved in funding a project to rehabilitate and privatise the Cambodian railway system, a project that has made life considerably worse for many that stand in its way. The project has forcibly displaced over 4,000 families living along the railways and there have been significant problems with resettlement sites. In May 2010, two children drowned in a pond as they went looking for water in their resettled home, which lacked running water. Tulsi, what causes these kinds of problems? Poor planning, unintended consequences, or troubling indifference to human suffering? I think I'm, I'm reluctant to say that policymakers have an indifference to human suffering. Um, that said, the underlying ide ideology that forms a lot of these policies um, is a reliance and a belief in the private sector overwhelmingly to um, achieve their aims and I think you know even going one level below that there's this really insidious idea that the means justifies the ends so there's an idea that to in order to bring development there needs to be sacrifices and often those sacrificed are the most poor and marginalized and I think we've gotten to a stage now where we've absolutely normalized the suffering of certain groups of people particularly those marginalized people so indigenous people people who live in rural areas farmers, people who live on mineral rich or resource rich lands, it's, it's widely considered to be normal for us to be able to do things like remove them from their lands. Ultimately when it's a private sector or, an, or a company that's responsible for these sorts of things, their primary consideration without doubt will always be pursuit of profit um, and therefore it's very difficult to then present them with, with a competing aim and I think that that just needs to be taken into consideration by policy makers when they consider consider who it is that's going to be delivering programs. So I think a lot of it is unintended consequences, but that said, I don't think that um, we should be very forgiving of that because it's just been, it's been enough years, you know, of, of making the same mistakes over and over and having the same trust in the same process, um, which, you know, particularly for the Australian aid program is that economic growth equals poverty reduction. And there's very little evidence to suggest that. On the other hand, there's a, there's a mountain of evidence to suggest that economic growth um, in the past two decades has actually led to widening inequality and often countries such as India and China that have seen you know unprecedented economic growth are actually experiencing the, the, the widest wage inequality that they've ever seen before and it's really interesting to see for example Julie Bishop use the example of China and India and the success of their economic growth to to demonstrate development outcomes and yes there has been an expansion of the middle class but what about the most poor and marginalized and that's what aid programs are there for for the most poor and marginalized so you know in the context of the Cambodia Railways project um, and many other projects like it uh, often there's a, pri there's a private company involved and often they're Australian or Australian linked and how they manage to win those tendering processes, um, why, what their prior experience has been, what their vested interests have been, these sorts of considerations are never taken into account by policymakers or by the government um, and there's no shift towards wanting to do that in the future despite the fact that this has happened. Australia actually remarkably many years after the case um, 
admitted that it had been, uh, sorry, the Asia Development Bank have, have admitted that it has been bungled. But Australia's managed to completely evade mm. any kind of responsibility for this. And this is the trouble with having many development players investing into one project is it's, it largely just allows them to um, dissolve any responsibility for, for one uh, company or um, investor. And I think that's what happened with the Cambodia Railways project um, and with no complaints mechanism mm. um, for them uh, to establish justice within Australia. They were really um, left on their own, which is, which is only one example of, of many. And in terms of um, being able to assess uh, or, or kind of improve upon that, there just needs to be structures in order to, to vet these sorts of companies. Otherwise, the same thing is going to keep happening again and again. The other area in which aid tends to be contentious is around how it's linked to refugee policy. So we've seen for a while now um, aid objectives either linked explicitly, you know, Tony Abbott might make comments about it um, in relation to Indonesia or also implicitly in terms of money we give to countries in the region that are then expected to all, uh, are currently rehousing refugees. Can you tell me a bit more about how that does undermine the integrity of our aid program? Yeah, and I think, you know, this is probably the best example of how aid is used as a bargaining chip um, to pursue Australia's national interests. You know, in the face of, you know, really significant aid cuts in the, in the recently released federal budget, uh, Nauru and Cambodia didn't sustain any cuts, which was no surprise, actually. And PNG only sustained a cut of 5%, but they still remain the largest recipient of aid money um, for Australia. Um, and I think that's really telling the extent to which Australia will go to um, to ensure that our national interests are, are protected um, in the context of the refugee issue. And just taking PNG, which I think is is really central for Australia's border protection policy because of the Manus Island Detention Centre. Mm -hmm. um, you can really see that that's absolutely taken priority above and beyond Australia's ability to be able to engage with PNG about some of their other issues like corruption. You know, never mind the enormous irony of using aid money in order to facilitate, you know, the ongoing suffering of, you know, the most marginalised people in the world, mm. you know, arguably against the law um, in Manus Island. I think in, a, in many ways I think that really shows the ongoing kind of neo-colonial relationship between the two countries that Australia on one hand uses aid money to uh, to finance anti-corruption measures through the governance and the law and justice aspects of the aid program yet uh, there's a court challenge that's being mounted within PNG um, to say that having the Manus Island detention facility is unconstitutional and Australia is funding that mm -hmm. um, and I think that really speaks volumes about um, the fact that Australia's national interest is, is always going to be on top um, and you know similarly with uh, anti-corruption measures despite the fact that you know millions of taxpayer dollars are spent every year through the aid program on these measures as I mentioned um, national anti-corruption measures that are happening within Papua New Guinea are not really getting any support through the aid program because of the political nature of them so there was a task force sweep that re recently happened um, against corruption in PNG really uh, thorough really well done um, Sam Coyne who was the head of that task force came to Canberra to actually seek uh, support from um, MPs that was knocked back um, he then went back to PNG um, and issued an arrest warrant for the Prime Minister for corruption charges and the Prime Minister of Papua New Guinea swiftly disbanded the task force and Australia was really silent on that mm. um, which uh, arguably could be because uh, you know their priority is the border protection policy and they're not in a position to speak out against the government. You're watching The World From Below and we'll be back after this short break to talk about what an ideal aid program would look like. Stay with us.